Hi, everyone. Give us one moment. We'll start in a second. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Hello and thank you again. My, um, we're very excited for you to be part of this press conference. I'm Bettina Inclan with Axiom Space. We are excited to share an, an update on the Axiom Space AX-1 mission, the first all private astronaut mission to the International Space Station. Over the next hour, we'll hear brief remarks from Axiom leadership on the goals of the mission and preparing leading, preparation leading to flight from NASA on its priorities for the low Earth orbit economy and expanded research capabilities, and from SpaceX on the status of the rocket and spacecraft exactly a month out from launch. Today's speakers are Michael Sofredini, the president and CEO of Axiom Space, Michael Lopez Alegria, AX1 crew commander of Axiom Space, Christian Mead. Meander, um, in space research and manufacturing Axiom Space, Kathy Leaders, Associate Administrator, Space Operations, NASA. Robin Gatins, Director of International Space Station, NASA. Phil McAllister, Director of Commercial Space Flight Division, NASA. And Benji Reed, Director of Crew Mission Management at SpaceX. Today's press briefing takes place as dynamic international events continue to unfold. Our thoughts and prayers are with the people of Ukraine. As we continue to monitor the conflict and hope for peaceful resolution, our teams remain committed to moving forward with this historic mission. We look forward to this opportunity to focus on AX1 and provide an overview of the work being done on this first all private astronaut mission to the ISS. In a moment, I will turn it over to our speakers and their opening remarks. Just a few housekeepings, just follow remarks. We'll open it up to questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please submit your question in the chat to the moderator. You could also raise your hand. In the chat, when, um, you, when you please mention your name, news outlet and affiliation and to whom you'd like to direct your question. Several questions have also been previously submitted um, online and we'll try to get those as well. As always with these video calls, as you know, please make sure that your mics are muted. And now we'll begin with an overview of the AX1 mission with uh, Michael Suffredini, president and CEO of Axiom Space. Suff? Thank you, Bettina. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Bettina said, this is a historical mission for two reasons, the first of which she mentioned, and that is that this is the first completely private mission to the International Space Station. There have been individuals that have flown on government flights, but never a completely uh, private uh, flight. So we're very excited about this being uh, the first, that the very first one of those. In addition to that, um, Axiom Space was founded to build a, a commercial space station, the first module will launch in a little over two years now. Uh, but this is our very first mission of uh, probably hundreds of missions to come over the next uh, several decades as, uh, as we build the, uh, the Axiom Space Station uh, and provide sort of services in low Earth orbit uh, for many decades to come. Uh, so this is very exciting for us uh, for, for both of those reasons. Of course, uh, when you look towards these kinds of missions, you're, you, I've never known anyone to have uh, really do this on their own. It's, uh, it's a group effort. Uh, and so together today, we're here together with uh, both our NASA counterparts who we've worked closely with over the last, uh, well, I guess since about 2016 when we really started this effort. And probably equally as long with our, our SpaceX friends as we've worked together uh, to, to uh, set up these first several missions. In fact, our first, our first four missions are already contracted with, uh, with SpaceX. And so uh, this is a group effort and, uh, and we appreciate the partnerships uh, with both SpaceX and, and, and NASA as, as we move forward. Um, I'm also very excited that, that this first mission is um, very representative of the kinds of flights that we will be, uh, uh, the kinds of missions we will be uh, providing uh, for many years to come. Uh, I think it's fantastic that it's an international crew. 
Um, I think it's also equally important to all of us that the, the crew's not just going to, uh, they're, they're not up there to paste their nose on the window. They really are going up there to do meaningful research uh, and make a difference each in their own way. Um, you'll hear a little bit about the crew, but I'll, I'll mention them each uh, just to give you a little highlight. Of course, Michael Lopez Alegria is a Axiom commander. Uh, he really, he needs no introduction. He's, uh, he's done it all, including commanding probably one of the most challenging increments in the, in the life of the International Space Station, uh, because that's when we were configuring from our interim power system to our final power system. And and the, the amount of work they had to do outside to make that happen was phenomenal. Um, so we're very happy to have him leading the mission. Uh, the pilot for the mission is uh, Larry Connor. He's uh, a, a US citizen. Um, he's got a number of things he wants to do, but in particular, he's working with the Cleveland Clinic and the Mayo Clinic, uh, advancing stem cell research and cancer research, as well as research on aging. Uh, Mark Pathy is one of our missions. Oh, oh Larry is our, our pilot, by the way. Mark Pathy is one of our mission specialists. He also has been working closely with um, uh, Canadian uh, universities and the Montreal Children's Hospital, and he has a, a host of research planned as well. And finally, we have an Israeli, uh, Eitan uh, Stibbe, and he is uh, really doing a lot of work with the Ramon Foundation. They have a number of research experiments that they've been doing in collaboration with the Israeli Space Agency. So this is really is a meaningful mission, uh, not only for uh, those four gentlemen, but for, uh, for all of us, uh, because what they're doing is really advancing uh, the state of humanity and human knowledge, which is uh, what our company is, uh, is built for. So uh, with that, I'll hand it back to Bettina. Thank you guys very much. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Michael Lopez Alegria, commander of the mission. Thanks, Bettina. Hey, everybody. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to be here with my colleagues, uh, past and present. Um, I'm very excited about that, but I'm much more excited about getting back into space uh, on this historic mission. This has really been a dream come true for me, and it's been amazing to see both the crew and the company mature and gel as we get ready for this uh, very important step into the future. Uh, we've been training a lot for the last several months. We have been the first crew to ever go through NASA's private astronaut syllabus, and we have checked all the mandatory boxes uh, we did that here at the Johnson Space Center next door here in Houston. Uh, the same is true for the Crew Dragon, which we did mostly out in Hawthorne at SpaceX headquarters. So we got uh, very familiar with the systems on both of those vehicles. And then finally, we've done a lot of work preparing to do the experimentation that uh, Mike would describe. In fact, I think it's a good opportunity to point out that um, this mission is very different from what you may have heard of um, in some of the recent, especially suborbital missions. We are not space tourists. I think there's an important role for space tourism, but it is not what Axiom is about. Uh, the crewmates, my crewmates have worked very hard. I've been super impressed with their diligence and their commitment. And uh, they, you know, they're busy people and they've taken a lot of time out of their lives to focus on this. And, and it's, um, it's definitely not a vacation for them. Um, for the next week and a half before we enter quarantine, it's mostly doing a little bit of refresher training, both uh, at JSC and at SpaceX. And uh, we have uh, also been doing some what they call baseline data collection, which is the collection of data for the experiments that we do. Generally, they like doing some pre-flight, in-flight and post-flight, and that will continue during quarantine as well. And basically that's it. We are in short, we're ready to fly. Over back to you, Bettina. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Christian Mender, Director of In-Space Research and Manufacturing at Axiom Space. Thanks, Bettina. Uh, it's exciting to be here. It's, uh, we've been working on this mission for quite a while. Um, it's just fantastic to be a month out and can't wait to see Mike and Larry and Mark and Aton uh, board, the, board the vehicle and head to orbit. They, I don't think Mike LA gave credit to the crew enough to talk about how well they have been preparing for this research mission that they are doing on here. Um, 
we have a serious research focus mission. It's really leveraging the opportunity of the ISS to really magnify what the ISS is there for, uh, what we what we use it for every day for research, and really kick off some some important efforts about building the low Earth orbit economy. When we talk about realizing the vision for LEO and a LEO economy, this mission is kind of the flag bearer for not only a standard for private astronaut missions for the future, but the future of research in microgravity. So this crew has been really dedicated to research. Um, they're actually taking more than 25 research experiments that have been developed for microgravity and have an additional 10 to 12 uh, pre and post only uh, experiments that they're doing. Um, and they're in collaboration with a lot of the leading health and science organizations across the, the world. And you've heard you've heard uh, Mike uh, Suffredini talk a little bit about this. So this collection of life science and tech demos really is a, a very a, a deep breadth of research that's going to kind of inform everything from human health considerations, both in space and on the ground, both and the novel infrastructures and design for future homes away from Earth. So we're looking at things including stem cells, uh, cardiac health. We're looking at uh, spacecraft self-assembly, um, a lot of different uh, experiments. And each of these projects have come to bear because of the interest of this crew. Um, early in the mission design process, they brought to us a portfolio of work. They said, we really want to do some of these things in orbit. And it's been, it's been a pleasure to work with them and with NASA and the National Lab to really bring these things to fruition for the, for the crew. And what's exciting about what they're doing is they're really making contributions to the future here. And so we're going we're gonna to see some neat results that come out of this mission. And I hope you tune in to the mission itself because there's going to be some fantastic video coming down from orbit. So um, in addition to the mi mission research that, that our crew is doing, we're also returning a selection of NASA life science investigations for continued uh, ground research once they back on Earth, basically. A lot of samples that have been on orbit need to get home and we're getting those home for NASA. And we also have a set of Axiom projects that we'll be doing that we'll be talking a little bit more about in the coming weeks. Um, uh, work that we're going to be doing with first Japanese commercial space payload is, uh, is flying with us. Uh, we have a project coming out of the Sanford Consortium and University of California, San Diego a project with MIT Media Lab and Aurelia and a project with a, a, a very well known cloud computing platform. And, and so we're we're excited to be doing some of these things because they open the aperture for what we're doing with commercial space. So in conclusion, I would say opening this lab uh, and opening the ISS up to new users and opportunities uh, really is exciting. And, and I'm encouraged to, to be doing this with, with uh, Axiom and, and we've really appreciated our partnership with NASA and, and SpaceX. And so we're gonna turn that back over to you, Bettina. Thank you, Christian. Next, we'll hear from Kathy Leaders, Associate Administrator, Space Operations, NASA. Well, you know, I, I think when LA said, you know, here we are with, you know, old colleagues, well, I won't say any of us are old, but with people we've all been working together with for a while, you know, um, I think it really shows the extent of the partnership and that as a partnership, we've been working on this for a while. Um, you know, I think uh, Mike and I sat in some meetings in 2006, 2007, and there was like a little bit of a gleam in our eyes at that point of, you know, would we be here getting ready to go do our first private astronaut missions? And it has been really amazing to see first us working with industry on cargo, then crew. I remember Mike LA, I think you were my first crew rep on commercial crew. And um, I don't think at that point, or maybe you were at that point getting ready to begin your, your planning for your first private astronaut flight up here. So, um, I will tell you, this is this is really a another example of how we've been kind of laying the foundation and working together and, and using the investment that the nation makes in NASA to continue to impart knowledge, work with partnerships to go figure out new ways to be able to use the capability that the nation's invested in. And um, it's pretty amazing to hear from Mike um, and LA and and uh, us, what the crew's getting ready to go do on orbit, because I know the station's been evolving over the last 10 years to continue to find new ways for us to be able to use it. Um, our crew members, you know, and they are very excited to have private astronaut crew members coming up. Obviously, you know, we've been focused on how do we do the exploration goal missions that they have. 
and, and continuing to expand the capabilities and provide that bridging gap while we are waiting for our private astronaut missions to come up and begin to, to me, move into this next continuum of having private astronauts also do research on space station. Obviously our crew members are focused on us getting ready for exploration and, and meeting the goals that NASA has and, and working on obviously maintaining the facility and keeping us ready so that our private astronaut friends can come up and be able to do the science of research that we need to be able to do. So very, very, very exciting time. We're gonna do this as a team, as we know, um, this is gonna be an important partnership going forward and uh, look forward to continuing to enable uh, private space and, and using the investment that, NASA, that the nation's really made in NASA to be able to continue to invest in our preeminence in the LEO commercial economy. Um, very, very, very exciting time for us. Really looking forward to this mission coming up. And um, Bettina, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Thank you, Kathy. Next, we'll hear from Robin Gatons, Director of International Space Station, NASA. Hi, everyone. Uh, so the space station team has been uh, excited about this mission. I've been preparing for it for a while and working really hard uh, with our friends at Axiom. So, uh, we're excited that we're 30 days away. You know, as we think about the goals that we want to achieve in this decade of results on the International Space Station, paving the way for a successful LEO economy is one of them, but also enabling future exploration beyond low Earth orbit, performing research to benefit and inspire humanity here on Earth, and growing our international partnerships. So when we think about the private astronaut missions uh, to the space station, it really touches on many of these goals. And by supporting these missions, we can enable private companies to begin developing customers for future commercial space stations. Uh, the private astronauts are planning impactful and inspirational research of their own. And, uh, and we're broadening the use of the space station and expanding our partnerships. So uh, as we get ready for this launch, we mentioned it's launching on March 30th. Uh, docking to the space station on March 31st and undocking on April 9th. And you've heard about the crew. After they dock, they'll, the crew will perform a suite of activities um, that's standard for any new crew arriving on the space station. And that'll include safety briefings, emergency reviews, familiarization, kinds of activities, a welcome ceremony and then uh, getting down to business and uh, getting their hardware on board and beginning their research. Um, Christian talked about the research. We're happy to host uh, 26 experiments in collaboration with the ISS National Lab. And we've been working hard to make sure those will be successful. And we, we're interested to see how those go and hear about those results. Um, lots of exciting research. And then really appreciate the Axiom mission returning some cargo for NASA. Uh, Christian mentioned some of the life science samples uh, that we'll be bringing back. And also um, one of our expended nitrogen tanks. Uh, so that's gonna help us out a lot because we've had a lot of, uh, we have a lot on board the space station right now and, and a lot of things in storage. So bringing that home for us so it can be refurbished will be really helpful. Uh, those are my, uh, conclude my remarks. I look forward to your questions and I'll turn it back over to Bettina. Thank you, Robin. Next, Phil McAllister, Director of Commercial Space Flight Division, NASA. Thanks, Bettina, and welcome everybody. I think uh, from the remarks that you've heard, it's pretty clear that the low Earth orbit economy is booming right now. Uh, there's a vast majority or vast uh, diversity of missions. You've got suborbital flights, we've got Inspiration4 type missions, even commercial Soyuz seats, and now private astronaut missions. It's really an exciting time, and it's something that we've been working forward at NASA for many years, starting with cargo, then with crew, and now we've got private astronaut missions starting, and then hopefully soon commercial LEO destinations uh, in the 2030 timeframe after the ISS retires. So it's really an exciting time, I have to say, uh, both at NASA and the private sector. We're very pleased to be partnering with Axiom on this private astronaut mission. And 
all these missions, they kind of have their own kind of nuance. They're all unique in a variety of different ways. So I wanted to talk a little bit about roles and responsibilities. It'll look the same if you're watching the mission. Uh, it'll be the same old Falcon uh, 9 with the dragon on top. So it'll look very much the same, follows the same trajectory, but behind the scenes, it will be very different. Axiom Space is really responsible for the most part for the passengers, uh, the crew members, their safety during the um, ascent and the launch that will be regulated by the FAA as well as the return and the recovery will be also managed by Axiom Space. NASA's involvement is fairly limited and it will be um, focused on the International Space Station. Once the Dragon vehicle gets close to the International Space Station, it's about a 200 kilometer range, it will enter in what we call integrated operations. Prior to that, it will be independent operations. So that it will be operating very independently from NASA. But once it gets close to the ISS, then NASA has responsibility for the safety of the uh, spacecraft, the ISS, as well as the crew members um, when they come. And so when they dock, uh, they will become part of the ISS crew under the supervision of the ISS commander. And then NASA will be responsible for their health and safety while they're on orbit. So I know a lot of people are used to coming to NASA for information. Um, and we're happy to provide uh, some of that, but primarily, again, this is a an Axiom uh, mission, and um, we will be following it uh, as we do almost all of these missions. The Dragon is very similar to the Cargo Dragon, so we will have some NASA personnel that do what we call fleet following, which means that they will be monitoring the mission real time, uh, the mission operations. As, as you probably know, we have another crew mission uh, crew four that's just a couple weeks away. So if there's anything off nominal, we want to sort of make sure that we are aware of that. And we are going to have um, a flight readiness review and we'll have an after uh, after that where we'll have a press conference, but it will be a very focused flight readiness review. It won't be the typical FRR that you may be used to for a NASA mission. We're really just focused in that FRR is is the ISS ready to receive this vehicle? Um, and are we ready to go from a space station standpoint? And we won't be going through the vehicle hardware like we normally do and all those checks and analysis that we perform as well as the Dragon. So it will be a very, very focused FRR. Um, again, mostly focused on is the ISS ready? Uh, but I think um, to, as Mike said, Michael LA, we've prepared for this. We've been working for it. Axiom has done its part. The crew members have been amazing. Uh, going through the training, and I think we'll be ready on the NASA side to provide uh, the limited uh, focused activities and um, resources that we will be doing. Thank you, Bettina. That's it. Thank you, Phil. And last but not least is Benji Reed, Director of Crew Mission Management at SpaceX. Good morning. Thank you, Bettina. Uh, first of all, I just got to say we are very excited um, about this upcoming mission. Uh, AX-1 is the first all-private uh, astronaut mission to the space station, and it's an honor um, for us uh, to be able to uh, participate in that and provide transportation services. Um, you know, on, on behalf of all the SpaceX team, we appreciate uh, Axiom um, and, uh, and 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 allowing us this opportunity to uh, to do this, and also to uh, um, you know to uh, NASA. Um, for uh, giving us the destination um, for this partnership to proceed. Um, you know, this is the first of four missions uh, that we will be doing with Axiom um, uh, Space, and uh, that's very cool. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a big deal uh, when we think about these, uh, these four astronauts who are going to be uh, traveling, you know, Michael and Larry and Mark and Aton. Um, we are we're honored um, that they would uh, choose to trust us um, and that their families uh, trust us to uh, carry them to the space station and then you know about 10 days later bring them home so first of all uh, those big thank yous um, as I sit here I have to admit that I think a little bit about um, you know growing up and seeing the space shuttle um, and you know that was designed to be a vehicle that would carry people to space carry people cargo equipment and, and really create um, constant access to um low earth orbit. Um, and, um, and it's just, it's awesome to be here thinking about the fact that here we are, right? We're, we're doing this now. We have, we're opening up, um, we as a, as a joint team, um, doing all of this work to continue to open up LEO and, uh, and especially to Axiom, whose, you know, goal is to really open up low earth orbit to, uh, to everybody. Um, you know, we often talk about how serious, uh, we take these responsibilities. 
it's um they're they're it's critical every every day we think about you know how are we making sure that we're carrying crews safely getting the critical cargo that the crews need on orbit um, safely um, and then of course bringing people back home to their families um, it's uh it's it's an exciting time um, and it's also a vigilant time when we have to pay close attention um, speaking of that down at the cape we have our uh, uh, falcon 9 rocket and also our dragon spacecraft um, are coming along well. They are on track for being ready to launch here um, in about a month. And uh, in fact, uh, after we finish the final steps of refurbishment on the Dragon capsule, uh, we'll be going into uh, what's, what we often call the, uh, the test drive. It'll be the first time that the crew gets to get into their vehicle. Um, uh, traditionally, that's more uh, referred to as the CEIT or the Crew Equipment Interface Test. Um, and, uh, and after that, of course, we carry on through uh, you know, finally integrating um, Dragon and the Falcon and uh, getting them out on the pad and getting ready to launch these, these folks to space. Um, you know, it's, uh, I want to just, again, thank you for the partnership. Um, you know, we want to ensure that uh, we work closely together to ensure all teams are ready to fly. There'll be another number of reviews, um, tests, uh, ongoing analyses that we all do. Um, that we do internally, that we do jointly to make sure that things are good to go. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, especially to NASA for um, all of the work that they've done and the opportunities they provided for us to grow um, into this industry um, as, a, as a team and, uh, and continue to provide that exploration of space. And thank you to Axiom again. Thank you, Benji. So with that, we'll start taking questions from um, uh, reporters. As a reminder, we have um, we we have some questions that have come in online. We have you can submit your questions in the chat, and to help keep us moving along, please say when if you have your mute um, your mic unmuted, please say your name, affiliation, and to whom you'd like to direct your questions. A quick reminder: there is a slight delay, so give us a second when you, when your your mics are unmuted, and we'll take our first question. And if we have time, we'll do follow ups. But our first question will come from Andrea Leinfelder with the Houston Chronicle. She submitted in the chat. She says, "I'd love some color on the final preparations." That will occur in Houston during the final month. Is the crew here training at the Johnson Space Center? If so, what are they doing and what's happening in the Axiom mission control? Thanks. You want me to well, take that, Bettina? Yeah, I was going to suggest, Mike, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so let me um, talk about the training piece and Seth, maybe you could talk about mission control. Um, so for training, as I said, mostly it's refresher training. We have uh, what we call a day in the life sim coming up. We'll be doing some other refreshers on important systems like the galley and the toilet and things that are, you know, we don't want to mess up for sure. Um, a lot of, as I mentioned before, baseline data collection, this is where they'll be taking blood, urine, all kinds of samples um, in preparation for the many experiments that we're doing. And then we also have a trip planned out west to Hawthorne to do the last few simulations of uh, launch and reentry in the SpaceX Crew Dragon simulator. And then we'll be uh, ready for quarantine. And we'll spend um, a, about half a day every day training in quarantine on many of the same things. Again, continuing with BDC and then focusing, studying, um, and getting ready for launch. Stuff? Yeah, from the uh, MCC side, actually, our, our Mission Control Center is up and running uh, here at our facility. It's uh, it's really going to be used for flight following mode, although we, we have utilized it to interact with the crew on orbit already through some of our experiments we've been working on. Um, but we will primarily operate uh, close to NASA at uh, MCC Houston, and we'll follow with, the, with the, our own mission control here. Uh, those preparations are really done. Um, for us, the last uh, final items we have to take care of is uh, getting the last few items uh, packed uh, to be uh, shipped and, uh, and packed on board. Uh, there's just a few items left there. Uh, but other than that, the team is uh, ready to go and uh, looking forward to the mission. Thank you. Our next question will come from Irene Klotz. Um, Irene, give us a second. You're, we'll open up the mic. Thanks, Bettina. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, nice to see you all. Um, my question, uh, probably for Seth, maybe for Mike L.A., did any of the training uh, for the private astronaut mission require travel to Russia? 
And if so, is the situation uh, with Ukraine affecting any of the uh, training and travel for the Axiom 2 mission? Thank you, Irene. Hey, Irene. Um, we did not travel to Russia. We did travel to uh, Cologne to train in the Columbus uh, module and uh, did some remote training with JAXA, but did not do any training in Russia. And I think um, our plan, you know, most of our activities are concentrated on the U.S. segment. So we would like to go visit over there. We, we need to be escorted. And the reason for that more than anything is just because of safety considerations, since we haven't had any training on the safety procedures and equipment in the Russian segment. And as for AX2, we haven't really begun training for that mission yet. So I know obviously no impact. Thank you. Our next question comes from Eric Berger. Eric. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for, for doing this. Now, I realize this call is about X1, and I respect that, but there obviously are very serious questions about the ISS right now in light of the Russian aggression in Ukraine. I was hoping maybe Kathy or Robin could give us an update on the status of the partnership. And also, has there been any consideration to giving or having Mark Vandehei come back on X1 instead of the Soyuz? Thank you. So I'll go ahead and take that one, um, Eric. So right now, operations are nominal. Obviously, you know, we're continuing to monitor the situation, but, you know, our control centers are operating nominally together. We've gotten the support we needed. Um, and so the, the team's meeting daily. We want to make sure all our folks over in Russia are, are operating. Everybody's okay. But, um, you know, we're continuing to operate nominally and do our training activities nominally. Um, but obviously, you know, need to continue to monitor the situation. Um, we right now in the same manner are, are planning on Mark and, and are getting ready for Mark to return. And, our, and all of the normal operations are in place for that, um, for us to be able to go do that. But as you know, we continue to, you know, as always, if you're, mon if you're working on space station, you continue to, to monitor the situation and operate. We have operated, and Seth's well aware, we've operated in these kind of situations before, and both sides always operated very professionally and understands at our level the importance of this fantastic mission and continuing to have peaceful relations between the two countries in space. Thank you, Kathy. Our next question were, um, was sent in from the chat and forgive me, I'm going to try to pronounce this correctly. Yafit Ovadia from Aerospace, correspondent for the Israeli financial newspaper. Um, what type of effect do you believe the research conducted aboard the ISS will have on the space tech ecosystem? And this question is for Christian. Uh, thank you. That, that's a great question. Um, I think what is great about AX1 is it, it's, it's kind of a pathfinder for opportunities in low Earth orbit. And uh one of the things that i think is most exciting about the work that the research that we're doing is it it ha it is a, a continuum or a spectrum of research that leans somewhat towards exploration all the way towards fully commercial but what we're seeing with this early research is um, an opportunity to start looking at modern tools for assessing uh, health in space we're flying a number of different instruments that are going to be checked out um, there are going to be some interesting questions answered around not just human health, but in space, but also human health on the ground. And those hopefully pay dividends as we invest into uh, invest the data that we are the research and the outcomes that we have into that into new new discoveries on on orbit. Um, there are a couple tech demos, too, that um, I think are going to be pretty fantastic. One that's looking at um, making optics in space. Uh, and using surface tension and fluids to do that. And there's another one that's looking at self-assembly of space of spacecraft uh, through uh, some various means. And the reason we get excited about that is when we talk about ourselves as, a, as an infrastructure company, um, these are the kinds of projects that we want to see happen because they, uh, they represent the beginnings of a future where we can build and manufacture spacecraft in space. And so to kind of close with your question, um, I think a lot of these 
I think a lot of these experiments uh, start to open up the space tech ecosystem, but more importantly, I think the mission and the opportunity that it brings um, really hopefully opens the aperture to a number of different companies to understand that um, space isn't just limited to those that want to ask exploration questions and then there are opportunities opening up for uh, uh, traditional companies to use space in a meaningful way to either answer questions for their industry or uh, some, some solve some sort of problem that they're having on the ground. Thank you, Christian. We have a, one of the questions that was submitted to us um, online is from elizabethhowellspace.com. This question is for MLA. Congratulations on the upcoming flights. Can you share some thoughts on the meaning for the crew to be the first to conduct a mission for Axiom Space? Any plans you might have to commemorate the, that milestone in space, such as flying any special items or performing any special activities? Well, thanks for the question, Elizabeth, and for the congratulations as well. Um, it, it means a lot. You know, this is, um, as has been said many times, the first fully private mission to the ISS. And with that, you know, we feel like we're going to be standard bearers. Uh, we really want to set the bar very, very high. Um, we're very cognizant that we will be guests aboard the ISS. I myself, when I was commander, received uh, a, a guest crew as a space shuttle at the time, but we know how that can be disruptive. Um, and so we're super sensitive to that. And, and we think that's a very good example to be setting for future crews. Um, everybody on the crew is, um, as I said, been very dedicated, very committed, very professional in this. And we really are taking this very, very seriously. It's, uh, it is not tourism, as I said before. Uh, we do have some special things uh, to commemorate the, uh, the significance of this event. I don't want to divulge them yet, um, so stay tuned, but we do have a couple things that uh, I hope you'll enjoy watching. And thanks again for your question. Great. Our next question comes from, sorry, um, Blake Schmidt from Bloomberg. Could you go over again the research projects? Um, this question is for Christian. Um, and can you give any more details on each of those? And I will say, Blake, we will be providing a, some a press release in the future with more details. A lot of the, the science will be happening on the mission, so stay tuned for that. But Christian? I'm sure I, I can recap what we've already talked about from the crew uh, with, with Aton and what he's doing with the Ramon Foundation, Israeli Space Agency. Um, it, it is a wide array of research, both tech demos and life science work. Um, Mark is doing a lot of life science and human research with uh, his collaborators and some of the um, Canadian universities and, and uh, the Canadian Space Agency, uh, Leap Biosystems, and, um, and uh, the Montreal Children's Hospital. And then, the, uh, and then um, Larry has got some really focused research from Mayo Clinic and Cleveland Clinic looking at a couple things. One is spine and brain health. Another project is looking at uh, the behavior of cardiac stem cells, and then also looking at uh, what is called a senescent cell or uh, cells that uh, have a role in aging in your body. And, and all of those are being, are, are being done in orbit uh, in a way that lets us look at uh, the cell response. And so Larry will be actually growing some stem cells in space. Now, beyond that, um, we have some projects that Axiom is doing um, that I mentioned before. Um, we're working with uh, a company called JAMS in Japan to fly a photocatalyst device that works on odor removal in space, and it uses a very low power and uses a different system than, than traditionally used, and we're going to test that in orbit. Um, we have a project with a Sanford consortium where we're flying uh, some tumor organoids, looking at their behavior, and we're going to be using a fluorescent microscope on orbit to understand um, some of the ac activation that's happening inside those cells along the way. Um, we have a project, uh, a couple other projects that I, I can't completely mention yet because we'll be talking about them. But one is, uh, I've already mentioned, is a self-assembling spacecraft technology that comes out of MIT Media Lab and a spinoff called Aurelia. And we'll be, we'll be flying that on orbit. And uh, Mike L.A. is going to have a, a fun afternoon watching uh, these little pieces uh, self-assemble in orbit. And hopefully it'll create some cool videos. So, um, that's a taste of what's going on. If I had to cover all 26 experiments, I'd use up the rest of the press conference, but uh, we're looking forward to talking a little bit more uh, in, future, in future discussions about all of the details. Thanks. Thank you, Christian. Next, we'll open up the line to Marsha Smith. Marsha? 
Thanks so much, Bettina. And again, respecting that this is really about AX1, but that there are events going on here on Earth, I was wondering if Michael <laughs> could give an update on the development of Axiom Station. And just in case agreement cannot be reached to extend ISS to 2030, is there a way to accelerate its development and shorten the amount of time it needs to be attached to ISS so it can become a free-flying commercial station? Yeah, thank you, Marcia, for the question. Um, first of all, an update. Uh, our planned launch date for our first module is uh, September of 2024. Uh, we just finished uh, CDR, wrapping up CDR for the structure, and we've got CDR, for, I'm sorry, CDR for the primary structure, and we've got CDR for the whole module. In fact, for the first two modules coming up uh, this summer, we're on schedule for that, and that supports the the launch date of uh, September of uh, 24. About six months later, a second module launches. It's very similar to the first. They look like, uh, if you're if you're a station person, they basically look like extended uh, nodes, if you will. Um, and then uh, after that, we fly a uh, research module, which is a modified MPLM focusing on research. Uh, and then from that point on, Really, we're sitting in a state waiting for the point at which ISS is ready to retire. And about a year before that happens, we'll bring up our power and cooling module. That's because it's a very large uh, solar array and it kind of interferes with the ISS solar arrays are already hard enough to operate it. They don't need any more challenges like shadowing from our big solar array. So we, we really wait till then. So our original schedule supported 2028. Um, we're, we're, of course, happy to support 2030, uh, but we are we do have some flexibility there. Thank you, Marcia. Um, our next question, we're going to open up live to Jeff Faust. Jeff? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Thank All you. right. Yeah, question probably for uh, Benji, since you've got crew four coming not long after AX1, um, how late could you still launch AX1 um, and keep crew four on track for mid-April? Um, and could you also remind us um, which Crew Dragon spacecraft you're using for both AX1 and crew four? Thanks. Okay, great. No, I appreciate that um, question, Jeff. Uh, Let's see. First of all, in terms of the the, the capsule assignments, um, actually, I just want to take a moment there and say how cool it is that we always get to talk. We have a fleet of dragons. <laughs> Everybody else has talked about. We worked with, you know, Mike uh, and 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 Kathy and and Phil for so long, and now we have a fleet of dragons. We got to talk about which one's going to which mission. I think that's just awesome. Um, but uh, let's see. Uh, we have Endeavor um, coming up next, and then we have um, it's actually a new capsule going on crew four, it'll be our two, 212 capsule is the serial number. Um, in terms of where we're at uh, in, in the schedule, you know, right now we, we're, we're on track uh, for launching AX1 in about a month. Um, and then, you know, a couple of weeks after that, our target is to be able to launch crew four. Um, there's, there, you know, there is margin in both of those schedules. I think we could, if we needed to, you know, I think AX1 could move a little bit. We hope it doesn't. Um, and I don't foresee right now, knock on wood, that there's a reason that it would uh, move. But if it does, it probably would be within, you know, days, the kind of measured in days kinds of thing. Um, and then it comes to crew four, similarly, right? We're on track. The crews are doing great. Training is going well. Um, that vehicle preparation, um, both uh, both vehicles, Dragon and Falcon, are, are on track. Um, and so I, I really think that we've got the margin that we need if there's a little bit of wiggle room um, and, uh, and, and be able to continue to launch, you know, because it's exciting. We get to uh, make sure we're, you know, taking Axiom up and bringing them home in 10 days and, uh, and then uh, Crew 4 goes up and then we have to be ready for, you know, even looking forward into the fall for Crew 5. Thank you, Benji. We have a question from Javier Gregori from Cadena Ser, the largest radio station in Spain. This is from Michael Lopez Alegria. Um, he would like you to answer it in Spanish. In English, the question is, you were born in Spain and you're one of the best astronauts in history. How could a small country like Spain increase participation in space? And, and Spain has just created the first Spanish space agency. Would you like to be, <laughs> um, he likes, for, if you would be interested in leadership there. Wow. 
Hola Javier, un, un placer saludarte. A ver, eh, yo creo que para España esto sí que es una misión simbólica, eh, como antes fueron los, los anteriores mías y también de, de Pedro Duque. Eh, sin embargo, yo creo que siempre hay la posibilidad de mejorar eh, su posición en cuanto a la, al sector espacial y se ve ahora que con eh, empresas privadas como eh, el que está lanzando, intentando lanzar cohetes desde España, es algo impresionante. Yo siempre he creído que la preparación de los ingenieros españoles es eh, igual de cualquier otro país, sino incluso mejor, y tengo mucha esperanza que estas, eh, avances, estos avances sigan eh, en, en este rumbo. Pues nada más. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, um, MLA, and thank you, Javier. Um, next question will come from David Curley from Discovery. David, your line's open. Thank you very much, Bettina. A question for Michael very quickly. You have your training with SpaceX, your NASA training for Space Station, your Axiom program, has that been defined by your experience at NASA? How is it different? And how does it feel flying for a company rather than a country? Thank you. Hey, David. Um, well, to be honest, it doesn't feel terribly different um, flying for a company than for a country. I mean, I think our, our um, focus is always safety and mission success, and, and that's really unchanged. I do have some different responsibilities because these, uh, my crewmates are my crewmates first and foremost, but they're also the company's customers. And, and that's obviously a consideration. Um, I would say the training at NASA has been kind of a pleasant surprise. I was um, thinking it would be a little routine, uh, but so much on the station has changed that, uh, and, I, and the rest of it, I forgot that it was like starting over again. And boy, SpaceX training in the Crew Dragon is an amazing vehicle. It's it's very exciting to to see how they've integrated the technology. You know that we sort of band-aided together a bit in the space shuttle with by adding portable computers, all integrated beautifully into um, into a cockpit that's su super clean and and just a pleasure to to work in. So, yeah, the, the training uh, for me and especially for my crew for whom this is obviously brand new in every sense. Uh, you know, we're just like kids in a candy store. It's been great. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Omer Azrang, GLZ Radio in Israel. Um, this one's for you again, for Michael to MLA. Can you put your finger on the main goal for this mission? Well, I would be remiss if I didn't say that the main goal is to complete it safely. Um, I think we all sort of assume that that will be the case and we're doing everything to make that possible. That's with our colleagues at NASA, SpaceX, uh, of course, within Axiom. Um, but more um, maybe to answer your question, I think we are, as I said before, really trying to set the bar high for future private astronaut missions to the International Space Station. And we have a very ambitious uh, timeline filled with a lot of experimentation and also a lot of outreach uh, to educational organizations all over the world. And I think if we can get through all of that and um, make our ISS hosts want us to come back, I think that would be uh, a win. Thank you. Next, we'll open up the line to Tim Fernholz from Quartz. Tim? Uh, hello, thank you for taking my question. Uh, I'm curious to ask a, another question about the research and how the projects were selected. Obviously, some are Axiom projects, but for the projects chosen by the um, spaceflight participants themselves, were those projects that were already in the National Lab pipeline, or were they projects that were just not even being considered for space research until the astronauts approached the sponsoring organizations? I guess I'm just curious how you sort of went about making sure you're bringing the most important research to space uh, for this mission. And also curious if you can say what share of the mission, uh, mission experiments are for Axiom and what share are brought up by the space flight participants. Thank you. Let's see. Uh, thank you, Tim. I'll, I'll take that. I'll answer the last question first. And I think uh, about, I would say about 10% of the content is is Axiom related and the other 90 is, is crew related. Um, 
In terms of how the research was selected, uh, it, each crew member brought a slightly different approach. Um, Eitan Stibe worked with the Ramon Foundation in Israel, and the Ramon Foundation actually put out a call for novel and new research. Um, some of the content came in was, um, I would say, revisions or iterations on, on things that had been done in the past, and some of it was completely new. Um, and then those projects were reviewed and selected. Axiom was part of that to provide feedback on the feasibility and those kinds of things. Um, and they were ultimately selected and then funding was secured and we went off to the uh, off to go get those uh, developed and ready to fly. Um, Larry had very specific uh, relationships with Mayo and Cleveland Clinic and specifically at Mayo, um, he, he had relationships with the Center for Aging and the and the the Center for Regenerative Medicine. And so we worked early on to, to actually collaborate with them. And some of our life science team sat down and said, you know, what questions do you want to ask? And we helped design some projects that would we would work. We found some some partners to help us do some of the, the stem cell research where we're not uh, where we don't have strength that, or, or we don't have uh, core competencies. And so we're working with uh, BioServe Space Technologies out in Colorado to do that work. And then um, Mark, again, similar to Larry, he had uh, institutions that he worked with, um, and we worked with him to de design a, a, a set of projects that he could fly. And a lot of these were questions that uh, were originally sought to kind of fly through the Canadian Space Agency, but ultimately, um, because of the, the allocation the Canadians get, they didn't necessarily always make the cut. And so they were uh, important questions that um, uh, that needed to be asked, and so they've, they've been added to the portfolio. Um, I think I would close to say that because a lot of these were new, we had to work really closely with NASA and the ISS National Lab to get these put together pretty quickly. And uh, I'd like to say thank you to the to the agency, particularly to the ISS program, um, and, and helping us work through a lot of uh, payload integration work to get these ready for the mission. And um, it's been a, a terrific partnership so far. And and it's thanks to it's thanks to the folks at the agency and all of the teams that support the agency that are enabling us to get these ready in short order and fly to fly to space. Thank you, Christian. And our last question will come from Micah um, Miedenberg from the Wall Street Journal. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Hi, Micah. Yes. Hi. Good, good morning. Um, I'd like to ask another broader question, if I may. It just, Kathy, I wanted to make sure I understand, does, does NASA have any backup plans in place to potentially boost the ISS or carry out other services that are currently handled by, you know, your Russian partners. Um, could you describe those plans if so? And if not, do you think NASA needs to, you know, articulate those sorts of plans in light of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Thank you. So my guy just, you know, the one thing I want to make sure everyone on the call gets is we are not getting any indications at a working level that our counterparts are not committed to ongoing operation of the International Space Station. We as a team are operating just like we were operating three weeks ago. So I just, um, the teams, our flight controllers are still talking together. Our teams are still talking together. We're still doing training together. We're still working together, obviously, we understand this, the global situation where it is, but as a joint team, these teams are operating together. That said, we always look for how do we get more operational flexibility and uh, our cargo providers and are looking at how do we add different capabilities. Um, we'd had Northrop Grumman had, has been offering up a reboost capability and you know, our SpaceX folks are looking at, can we have additional capability? That to me is, we've been looking at that more from an operational flexibility perspective. Um, currently there is, is no plan. It would be very difficult for us to be operating on our own. The ISS is an international partnership that was created as an international partnership with joint dependencies, which is what makes it such an amazing program. It's a place where we live and operate in space in a peaceful manner. That's, that's really a model for us to be operating in the future. And I actually feel like this is a, a good message for us that, that we are operating peacefully in space now and moving forward. Obviously we have to begin to 
and 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 as a team, we are looking at how where where we may have operational flexibilities. But Micah, um, it would be a sad day. It would be a sad day for international operations if we can't continue to peacefully operate in space. And as a team, we are doing that. Thank you, Kathy. And with that, um, our hour has come to a close. I'm going to turn it over to Michael Suffredini, CEO and President of Axiom, for some closing remarks. Well, first, uh, thank all of you for your questions and your interest in our mission. Um, we're very, very excited about this first flight. It uh, has huge meaning, as we mentioned before, uh, to us, and I believe also to uh, it has a worldwide. Uh, implications given that these flights for us are really precursor missions for learning how to operate in space, uh, particularly with our, our with the international partners, um, because really we have to operate together while we're attached. And, uh, and so these missions give us a chance to practice that at a smaller scale so that when our, when our space station shows up, uh, we kind of uh, figured out how to do this. So to us, these are all steps towards uh, a bigger space station and 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 with that uh, when, when you think about it that way it's just a very very exciting uh, time for us uh, once again I want to thank uh, both NASA and SpaceX uh, they have been just uh, fantastic to work with this is a this is a very very challenging thing to do um, it's uh, it's made easy uh, by it made it's made to look easy uh, by both NASA and SpaceX. But I can tell you that's that's uh, furthest from the truth. Uh, and we're just very excited to be doing this with them. So uh, again, thank you all very much. Uh, and we're looking forward to the launch here in about uh, 30 days. And thank you so much, um, Mike. And, and that's all time we have today. Thank you so much for joining us. I know that we have lots of questions and we couldn't get to all of them. So we appreciate your patience during this, this time. And please send us your follow-up questions to media at axiomspace.com and we'll try our best to, to respond to them. We encourage you to follow the mission at axiomspace.com and on social media with the hashtag AX1. As a reminder, media credentialing is closed for foreign nationals, but it's still open for US-based media until March 14th. Please email media at axiomspace.com for de details on credentialing. Um, we, we, we encourage everyone, including badge holders, to secure credentialing to ensure you have access to all events. And if you'd like to set up an interview with the AX1 crew, please email media at, at axiomspace.com and we'll ensure your request gets to the crew members. Thank you so much for your time and appreciate um, tuning in today. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.